Good morning. My name is Pastor David Kenny, and this is Walden Community Church. Last week, we looked at how the Bible got put together, because our series through the rest of winter is the God's Honest Truth. We wanted to find out how the Bible was received, how it was first put together, and we used historical artifacts, and we used things that we could prove the Bible was true. We used things that could back it up, things that could give it legitimacy. And it was a lot. And you could say, well, was that everything? Well, no, because in the history of the Bible, we got up to about the Middle Ages. <laughs> and unless you frequent the Texas Renaissance Festival, you probably know very little about the Middle Ages, but it was the thousand years between the Roman Empire and the Reformation. It was the time of Robin Hood and Joan of Arc and the Code of Chivalry. You got King Arthur in there and then Knights of the Round Table. During the Middle Ages, the church in the East faced the challenge of Islam and the challenge the church took in the West was the Crusades. And this is the beginning of the Middle Ages. And so it's a dark time, the time of confusion and ignorance and disorder. And through it all, the church was remaining and trying to just integrate itself into the life of the family and be the, the repeller of the commoner's life. The church of the West touched everyone's life. From the richest king to the poorest serf, everyone belonged to the church. They were baptized in the church, would pray in the church, get married in the church hear sermons in the church, live by church laws, and pay their taxes to the church. The parish was the center of town. The cathedral was in the center of the city, and the king paid honor to the pope. So with the church dominating all of life, it's no wonder that the stories and teachings of the Bible permeated through people's thoughts and lives to the extent that it would have been hard for us to imagine today, the Bible was told in drama, in art, in poetry, and even architecture. And some of the most fascinating relics of the Middle Ages are beautiful pages of the Bible surrounded by gold leaf illustrations. And you could say, yeah, but I mean, by now the Bible is printed, it's assembled. Surely that's the end of the story. Well, not so much. Because now we need to talk about the translations of the Bible. And sadly, this is where another lie or another rumor gets spread around a lot. People start talking about which translation is the best. And sadly, it's a war that people are still fighting today. Why are there so many translations? And how did this all start? Well, the Church of the West used the Latin Vulgate. Now, Vulgate just means vulgar, which means common. This is the Bible that common people read. And in the East, the people read the Bible in Greek. Today, it's not common to find an entire Greek manuscript, but one of the earliest we know was from the fifth century, and it was a copy of the book of Genesis called the Cotton Genesis because it was assembled by a man named Robert Bruce Cotton. The book was beautiful because it had more than 300 miniature hand-drawn illustrations on over 400 pages. The manuscript survived for 1,250 years, and then in 1731, there was a fire, and today, only 18 of those pages remain. Back then, like we said, everyone knew about the Bible, but most common people couldn't even hear it or read it in their own language, chiefly because the church of this day was translating the Bible into a language that was not the common tongue. Why? Well, because first, let's say if French is the language of love, then Latin became the language of faith. So for both style reasons and preference reasons, that demanded the Bible be translated into the best language, naturally. And second, the reason why it was done was because this was a form of control, which means 
If you wanted to know what the Bible said, you had to go to church and listen to the priest. It was a way for the church to build dependability into their followers. And so it was around 1320 that a man named John Wycliffe came onto the scene. Now Wycliffe was a trained mathematician. He was a scientist and he was a theologian. And it was his philosophy that since Jesus was poor, then his church should be poor as well. He hated the wealth. He hated the opulence of the church. And he hated the hypocritical nature of the church because you see the kings and the rich owned a Bible and it was written in French just for them. But the poor were denied a Bible in their own tongue. So Wycliffe began a back roots following of missionaries that he called the Lollards. Now Lollards is not a nice name. <laughs> it's a derogatory term to denote a uneducated person. Wycliffe's missionaries followed the instructions of Jesus. They wore robes, they wore sandals, they carried a walking stick, they journeyed in poverty, and they shared the gospel with people who would give them room and board. And so it wasn't long before Wycliffe made a choice that he was gonna translate the Bible into English. Wycliffe worked on the New Testament and he had a colleague uh, working on the Old Testament, but when his friend was excommunicated from the church and left England, Wycliffe was forced to finish the entire Bible on his own. And even though Wycliffe died from a stroke in 1384, for the next 31 years, his English Bible was in circulation. But then in 1415, the Church Council of Constance declared him a heretic. And all of his authored books were burned by the decree of the Pope, and then they exhumed his body, <laughs> burned him again, <laughs> and cast him into the English River. And then in 1408, the Archbishop declared it illegal to translate any portion of the Bible into English or any other language. Today, we only have about 250 copies of Wycliffe's Bible. But between 1450 and 1550, the world changed. And the big change was literacy. There was power in the written word. And during the next 100 years, four major things happened in the story of the Bible. Number one, the invention of the printing press. Number two, widespread translation into the spoken language of the people. Third, if you have more translations, right, that means more eyes and more people are studying the word. And so that means more people were becoming enlightened and they were discovering the meaning. Four, the Reformation removed the Pope and the church as the supreme authority and the Bible became the bedrock of the faith. Which means the Bible that you have right now in your hands we owe just as much to Johann Gutenberg, or John Gooseflesh. Here is a guy who took the idea of a wine press and said, huh, I wonder if I could make books with that. <laughs> it was said of Gutenberg that he could print as many books in a day as it had previously taken in a year. Before Gutenberg, the Library of Congress only had 122 books. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, let's say uh, my own library in my office, right? Every single one of my shelves in my library has about 35 books. So 122 books would only be four shelves. Think about that. The Library of Congress, four shelves of books in an entire collegiate library. Gutenberg's Bible was beautiful. It wasn't just some hack job in uh, Times New Roman. Gutenberg made his own font and he was trying to emulate the handwriting. He was trying to emulate calligraphy and he assembled 100,000 pieces that could resemble a hand-drawn uh, calligrapher's pen. Plus, each Bible was printed on vellum and that came from 160 animals. And by the year 1500, the printing press were popping up all over, and it's estimated that over 30,000 different titled books 
were being published. So by the time Martin Luther was born in 1483, he grew up with the Bible as a printed uh, volume. I mean, he's like a child that grew up with cell phones and the internet. He doesn't know another way to live. But it seems even in Luther's day, the church is still experiencing problems with power and corruption. In 1517, the Pope was building a huge basilica for St. Peter. It was a very costly enterprise, and so he was trying to raise a bunch of capital. So the Pope started selling salvation. He started selling forgiveness of sins. That made Luther so angry. So he wrote an email. Well, in their day, it was called a letter. And in his letter, he came up with 95 reasons why the church was wrong to do this. Suffice it to say, the church was not happy. They called Luther a drunken German, and Luther shot back and he called the Pope the Antichrist. (laughs) And so it was men like Luther and Zwingli and John Calvin and others who paved the way for the Protestant Reformation. It was a split in the church. And one of their battle cries was the Latin phrase we learned last week, sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And so Luther set out to print a Bible into readable German. The Bible had been previously printed in German, but Luther was gonna make a more contemporary, kind of more street, more urban translation. Luther said, I endeavor to make Moses so German that no one would ever suspect he was a Jew. So just like Wycliffe, the Pope banned all of Luther's writings, as well as his German Bible. But because of the printing press, it was very hard to stop. Within 50 years, just a single printing press would have been responsible for about 50,000 copies of Luther's Bible alone. In fact, several Bible translations that were a first-time print in the Middle Ages are still being used today. Luther's German Bible, the King James Version, and the Dewey Rhymes, just to name a few. Well, the English language, of course, evolves, and it's constantly on the move. And so as the years go by, there was a need for a clearer English translation. And even though Wycliffe had translated the Bible into English about 150 years ago, it was still written in Middle English, and that was difficult to read. So that brings us to this man, William Tyndale. Tyndale was a lot like Bill Gates. He saw that the Bible was technology, and he saw how important it was. And so it was his hope to put a Bible in every home, which means the church didn't like him either. (laughs) which forced Tyndale to move to Germany, where he met Martin Luther, and the two of them got into a whole mess of trouble. It was Luther and Tyndale's hope to get a readable English Bible back to England. But King Henry VIII at that time was Catholic, and so he opposed them at every turn. So the two of them took to smuggling Bibles into England with groceries, because it was a commodity, and like any other commodity, If you tell the public that they're not allowed to have it, then they want it all the more. Tyndale, of course, was eventually arrested. He was jailed for 16 months. He was then executed. And his last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. But by the time Tyndale died, the Bible had already sold over 50,000 copies. And over the next 75 years, Bibles in the vulgar, common English exploded. And this is where we introduce the King James Bible. When Mary, Queen of Scots, was imprisoned in 1567, her son James uh, VI became King of Scotland, where he ruled for 35 years. In 1603, he became James I, when he also became King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And yes, He was a Protestant. And sure, we'd like to think that everyone's motivation for printing a Bible translation was holy and pure, but sadly, as it is with some people, it's usually about politics. At the time, King James comes into uh, the Bible's history 
the Geneva Bible was the most popular. It was pocket-sized, it had maps, it had notes, it was available in the most common language, anyone could read it, but King James I of England hated it. So James set out to create a new translation of the Bible to compete with the common translation that was currently in circulation. And he called for the highest, most brightest, most educated people from Cambridge and Oxford to be a part of it. He had 54 scholars, he had six different committees, and they set about to write this new translation. The King James Version made its debut in 1611, and it took off, primarily for two reasons. First, it was the King's Bible, so that made it the best, right? It made it a must-have item. It was the Rolls-Royce of Bibles, and the King said it was the best, so if he said it was the best, it's the best, and don't you want the best? Oh, and secondly, uh, it became popular because King James made the Geneva Bible illegal. What about translations today? Well, today, a lot of work goes into a translation. And so once the work is done, the translation gets copywritten. And that means that translations are owned by the publishers who print them. So if you're a printing house and you want to print a copy of the Bible, you would need to pay for a copyright to another publisher to do it. For instance, the ESV, English Standard Version, that we have in our own pews is owned by Crossway. No other publisher prints it. So how does Crossway get around copyright law? Well, instead of paying another publisher their copyright, you just print your own version. So Bible translations are sometimes public domain, which means anyone can print it. The King James Version is public domain. Anyone can print it, unless you live in the United Kingdom, where the British Crown still owns the license today. But the influence of the King James Version is profound. It helped form our language. It gave us context in our literature. It inspired our music for centuries. It was the one book that every family owned and read. Now, it's November right now, and this is the time where we think about the pilgrims, and we think about how our nation became a nation. Our little children will come home from school with pilgrim clothes made out of paper bags and turkeys made from paper plates. But today we're talking about truth, and the truth is the history of the pilgrims is heavily connected to the history of the Bible. The truth is, the first colonists that came to America came for the express purpose to study the Bible free from the crown. In 1620, only nine years after the King James Version is printed, the pilgrims land on Plymouth Rock. And 20 years after that, they have their own printing press and they begin printing the Bible. And the first American colleges were actually seminaries trained to educate ministers to teach the Bible. And in 1777, Continental Congress voted to import 20,000 Bibles to America. But the first complete Bible to ever be printed on American soil was actually a Bible used for missionaries. It was by a man named John Eliot. He translated the Bible into Algonquin one of the world's most difficult languages, but it was a language that was used by the Native Americans, and it took him 10 years to write. The first Bible printed in America in a European language was Martin Luther's German Bible in 1743. Later, the American Bible Society was founded in 1816, and they led four campaigns to put a Bible in every American house. And between 1882 and 1890, more than six million families benefited and nearly half a million received a Bible. How do people go about translating the Bible today? Well, every single time a new translation comes out, do you think they have to 
fly down to Jerusalem and go through the archives and begin the translation from scratch and uh, use the relics and the fragments? No. Today, because of the printing press, we have the most accurate, reliable Hebrew and Greek sources, and they are available to anyone on Amazon. <laughs> the Hebrew source is called the Stuttgartensia, which is a copy of the Masoretic text, and it's based on the Leningrad Codex. The Greek source document we use is the Nestle Aland. Originally, it was the Polygot Bible, and it's currently in its 28th edition. Now, it's in its 28th edition because it's constantly being updated and improved upon as we learn more and more about the Greek language. Why is this important? Well, for anyone who thinks that the Bible translation changes over time, like a big game of telephone, that's a lie that you've heard spread, that through the years, and because we have all these different translations, surely the Bible has changed its meaning. We've changed the words, right? But it's not like that. New Bible translations use the same source documents every single time. New Bibles are not born off the backs of their predecessors. Translators and editors always go back to the beginning. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I want to show you four things about the Bible that the book of Hebrews says here. First, the author of Hebrews says the Bible is living. It's living. Thanks to Gutenberg, the Library of Congress now boasts to be the largest library in the world with more than 150 million items and approximately 838 miles of bookshelves. The collection includes more than 32 million books and other printed materials, 3.0 million recordings, 15 million photographs, 5 million maps, and 61 million manuscripts. But in all of that, the only book in the Library of Congress that's alive is the Bible. The word living is the Greek word zeo, and it literally means breathing. Last week we read 2 Timothy 3, which said all scripture is breathed out by God. As Christians, we understand that the Bible is a living document because we can feel its words in us and we can see how it continues to teach and inspire every generation. Second, Hebrews 4 says the Bible is active. Now the word active is the Greek word energy. <laughs> and it's where we get our English word energy. <laughs> we know that energy means work, right? Energy is a continuous action. The Bible is a working book. It is not a doormat. It is not inactive. It is not flaccid. It is not cold. The scriptures are living and active. And when we read those words, they reach out and touch our lives in a tangible way. God says of his own word, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God describes scripture as being a living agent, as being his messenger that God sends out. He sends his word out to touch our lives. So unlike any other book, the scriptures are living and active. And third, the Bible says it's a piercing word. It's piercing like a sharp sword can flay open the human body with one slashing blow so the sword of God opens up our life if we would let it. Now, a sword can sometimes be associated as a weapon or a weapon of violence. And true, it can be used to attack and defend against your enemies, but the Hebrew writer uses it to describe a sword that cuts ourselves. And perhaps today we would say the Bible is a scalpel. It's a surgeon's knife that is precise and knows exactly where to cut in order to heal. Lastly, the Bible is discerning. The word here in the Greek is the word kritkos. It's where we get the English word critic. 
Last week I asked why people would try to discredit the Bible. Why would they want to tear it down? Why would they want to find flaws with it? Why would you want to poke holes in it and lie about it? And it's for this reason. The Bible penetrates into the innermost recesses of our being. And it does so as a critic. It delves into the shadows. It exposes our darkness. And because it is alive and active, the Word of God then breathes into us and transforms us from the inside out. Samuel Chadwick said, No one is uneducated who knows the Bible, and no one is wise who is ignorant of its teachings. Now, today, I own something like 26 to 30 Bibles. I'm a Bible junkie, and right now, there are probably four or five more Bibles that I wish I had. Hey, some of you buy fishing rods, and you buy rifles, maybe you buy shoes. I buy Bibles. So, which translation is the best? If you go to YouTube, type that in, you will find people promoting and tearing down every translation out there. I saw videos that said this or that translation was garbage. Garbage! First of all, that's horrible. Horrible. No popular English translation of the Bible is garbage. Remember last week, we said, this is God's word, right? This is God's word, and God knows that this is the book we have, and this is how he communicates with us. So he is never going to allow his book to be twisted or distorted. The truth is, it's all God's word. It's all God's word, and it's enough. The Bible you have is enough for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The Bible you have right now is perfect. Your Bible is a perfect translation. But the truth is, it doesn't matter what translation you have on your shelf if you don't read it. And this is my take home for you. And I want you to think about your Bible. Yours, your Bible, the one you read, the one you have on your shelf, the one you have by your book stand, the one you have on your lap. Do you like reading it? Do you understand it? Because I would argue if the answer is no or eh, maybe, then I want you to go out and get another one. I'm serious. Give yourself permission to buy a Bible that you like. This is the story of God. And it's unlike any other book in human history. And if you own a Bible that has a difficult translation, it has no helpful notes, it's missing pages, or in any other way just doesn't excite you, then get a new one. I get asked that all the time. What's the best Bible to get? And my answer will always be the same. The best Bible is the one you will read. Translation varies because the English language is diverse. And many people and publishers, they have their own opinions about which words are best and which words to use. Now, does that mean that any one Bible is any better than the other? No, <laughs> right? Because the Bible was never written in English anyway. It was written in Greek and Hebrew. Bibles are like cars, okay? That's how you should think about it. Bibles are like cars. They all look different, they feel different, they have different features, but they all get the job done. They all take you from point A to point B. If you walk into a bookstore right now, any Bible that's on the shelf is a good Bible. The only way you're gonna know which one is best for you is if you take it for a test drive. A real quick lesson in translations. Translation ranges from two points word for word, and thought for thought. And it all depends on what you're looking for. Word for word means the best possible word in English is chosen in that sentence. And it gives you the best picture of the precise, literal meaning of every word. Thought for thought translations take great care to communicate English to the point of the meaning and usage of contemporary English. That makes the translation easier to read, 
easier to understand. Typically, my advice is you need one of each and you read them side by side to get the best possible understanding. If you look at this chart, notice which translation is dead center, the new international version. That's why it's the number one seller. My advice is go to the bookstore, open several translations to the same exact passage and read them all. And then you decide what Bible you want to read. The Bible in our pew in church is the English standard version. Notice it's four from the end as being a literal word for word Bible which means it's great for Bible study, and it's the translation that Joanna and I both use for our post personal reading and study. I will always recommend a study Bible. You want notes, right? And the reason why you want notes is much of the most critical and theological questions have already been discussed and argued by people who are so much smarter than me. And so when I read, I would like to hear their input too. Of course, I believe we are still able to read and discern scripture on our own, but I think it's even better to do in a community setting. Many Bibles also have a focus. For instance, if chronology is something you're interested in, you can buy a Bible that's in chronological order. If archaeology is something that fascinates you, you can buy an archaeology Bible. If apologetics and sharing the gospel is important to you, you can buy an apologetics Bible. What about language? Well, there's something out there called the Key Bible, and they underline all the words, and then you can go to the back and find the Hebrew and Greek definitions. There's even a dad's Bible, there's a mom's Bible, there's a teen's and kid's Bible. And yes, Bibles can be expensive. A lot of printing and effort goes into a Bible, so they're not always cheap. But if getting a new Bible means it's gonna assist you in your relationship with God, then it's worth it. One of my favorite quotes is from John Wesley, and I'll leave you with this. He says, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, and God himself has condescended to teach me the way. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. Let me be a man of one book. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for this book, and we thank you for the truth and its history and what it teaches us. It teaches us how important it is, how important it's always been, how people will literally do anything, go to any lengths to read it, to hold it, to have it. Lord, we are so blessed, each one of us, that perhaps many of our homes have multiple copies of this book. Lord, may we be people of the book. May we read it, understand it, know it, and live by it. Lord, if we would all just but read this book, we could transform this church, we could transform this community, we could transform this state, we could transform this nation, Lord, teach us your way, teach us your will, teach us your wonder, teach us your grace, teach us forgiveness, teach us love. May we be people of this book. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this morning. I would like to remind you that we are open and we would love to have you return to church. We miss you very much, and we would certainly love to see your smiling face and be welcomed back. Uh, we've, we've saved a space for you. Uh, just as a reminder, we have two services every single Sunday. We have a service at 9.30, which is traditional. We have a choir. We have a second service, which is at 11 o'clock. It's more contemporary, and we have a worship band. At the 11 o'clock hour, we also have children and uh, Sunday school time, as well as a time for our youth. Our youth also meet on Wednesdays at six. Now we're here, we're close, we're right in the neighborhood. You can send your kid over uh, on foot or on a skateboard or on their bike and we'll even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in, a, in about an hour and a half. 
Hey, we love you, and we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you next time. Bye.